Okay, uh, my name is Gary Stevenson, and this talk is going to be on application of living system theory to Mars missions. Uh, the, the question uh, has come up in the model based system engineering uh, community. What are, are we really uh, modeling uh, missions, human missions, correctly if we're, if we're ignoring the fact that we're biological <coughs> beings? And <coughs> crews taken together can be understood as representing a biological entity. So I have to figure out how to forward this. There we go. Uh, so this talk is going to introduce um, James Miller's living systems theory categories for those of you who aren't biologists or not familiar with those categories. Uh, it's going to uh, hit on how to apply these, especially to um, life support systems. Uh, and then uh, use, apply some uh, model-based system engineering tools uh, to those living system categories to try to represent it. So it's time for something completely different, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Why is this, a philosophy, why is this put in the philosophy section? Uh, you'd have to ask the organizers that question. But certainly model-based system engineering is a philosophy that, that purports to represent systems uh, using functional analysis. So uh, this, this is an introduction to uh, James Miller's living systems theory functional categories. Uh, these are in three different groups. Uh, matter energy living systems theory categories, information processing categories, and categories of functions that, uh, that process both uh, matter energy and, uh, and information. Uh, so we have things like ingesting and excreting, uh, mass storage, conversion uh, in the matter energy. In information processing, it's the typical network-based, um, there's the network, there's uh, inputs and outputs, uh, and there's memories and associators. So this has been applied uh, to space already by James Miller himself. This is a diagram that shows some of the uh, matter and energy flows going in and out of the space station. The symbology, if I back up for a second, these symbols aren't used much anymore. Uh, they're, number one, there's, there's not good uniformity in that symbology. Uh, and uh, number, number two, uh, it's, you know, people don't use that schematics. Uh, it's a little too obscure. So that's why I'm introducing these trigraphs that, that really help with the block diagrams. Uh, in, in terms of understandability. So you'll see some of these symbols and you, you may even notice that some of these symbols don't look the same as, as what became the standard for living systems theory um, functions. So how do we start with this? Um, uh, in in model-based system engineering, uh, you really want to understand when you're looking at a human mission you want to understand what, what is the context of that mission. And so to do that, you have to divide the, all of reality into what's inside of the system versus what's outside of the system. Uh, and so that's, that's the boundary that you're defining. So here's the boundary of the crew. And they need water and food and oxygen. And they, they also consume information. They also export information. They export waste and CO2 and water vapor. Uh, and that is all within the boundary that defines the crew. And then you have another boundary here. So this is, in a sense, a nested context diagram. There are two context diagrams. One, the, crew to the, co the context of the crew with respect to the transhab. One, the context of the transhab with respect to deep space. Uh, is that a structure, by the way, the transhab? It's not to be understood as a structure. Uh, as a matter of fact, it may wind up being two structures. As we'll see with the surface hab, you may wind up separating them. Uh, and I drew over here on the, on the whiteboard because I didn't really have a slide on it. But the next step after this, uh, in terms of uh, functional decomposition, is, is breaking it into subsystems. So for instance, if you have a lot of hazardous processing, which we'll see in a block diagram of this, you may want to put that in the service module. You, you may not want that in with your astronauts. Uh, and so uh, when you split this context diagram into two subsystems like that, you define uh, internal interfaces. And when you're defining these internal interfaces, uh, it's important to uh, 
to show the context of that with respect to, to what these other subsystems are. Uh, and so uh, we'll, we'll get to this in a little bit during the paper, but this brings up a really interesting point that I, I, I want to hit on it before I forget. And that is when we're defining uh, open system architectures for space, we want to make sure that we pick the best possible interface standards, not only for our internal interfaces, but also for our external interfaces, so that when, you, when it comes time to change components or upgrade technology, you have standard interfaces. So that's for open system architecture. Uh, that's going to be a, a real important open systems. That's going to be a, a really uh, important part of this methodology. Uh, this is a context diagram uh, for the surface of Mars. Uh, so this is a surface hab. You see the crew has the same needs. But now we can, we can uh, meet the crew's needs uh, in terms of the outer context diagram a little bit differently. The cooling, for one thing, is much easier. If you have energy flowing through from your solar panels and you have waste energy coming out, uh, you can conductively cool to the ground. You can convectively cool to the thin atmosphere. There's also the possibility of now bringing food. You don't have to store all your food anymore. You can possibly bring food in, possibly also derive water from the regolith and bring water in. So it's a much more porous context diagram. Uh, and that will be important when you, when you divide, you start dividing and splitting this up. Uh, you'll see the, the standard interfaces we're defining will be different. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, only to say you have the same problem for, uh, for spacesuits. This is, this is one for deep space, um, extravehicular mobility unit. Uh, and the crew uh, obviously doesn't have to eat if the mission is short enough, but has all those other needs as well as getting audio in and out. Uh, and the same thing, uh, slightly different problem with uh, surface inhabitant, now wearing a surface suit for, for Mars surface exploration. Uh, and I saw an interesting talk yesterday, and this is why it's fun to go to these conferences. When we're parsing this, uh, many of these functions will wind up in a backpack. So when we're, we're splitting it up, you know, it, it'll be partly his suit itself, partly the backpack, life support system. But a lot of these, like comm relays, might be able to live in a separate robotic unit that's a follow along artificial intelligent unit. And that was presented yesterday. And I thought that was a fascinating idea because all of a sudden you don't need to carry a lot of gear for exploration. You don't need to carry a big comm relay. You have a robot following you on Mars, or if it has the nav system, you're following the robot potentially. Uh, and say so you, you have a companion that will fulfill some of these requirements in the context diagram as an explorer. I also want to touch real briefly on how to, because there are so many uh, living systems theory categories, how to parse them out. And one way is with this uh, hatley Purby uh, diagram that system engineers love, because we also call IPO diagrams. It puts everything neatly into inputs, processing, and outputs. If we look at the... Um, at the living systems theories in the context of this template. Uh, the ingestion is our input, excretion is our output, which also uh, reproduce is a form of matter output. Uh, motors and uh, the producer is, is essentially the user. Uh, and then we have a distribution of matter, conversion, storage, uh, and boundary, and so on, support. Uh, this is a little bit busy, but it shows how for a living, uh, uh, life support system, uh, it fits within that context. Uh, it's not a good diagram in the sense that there are too many boxes on it. You should have three to seven in a good decomposition. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in the future, you know, you would do with the water system potentially separately from the oxygen system, separately from the waste management system. Uh, and so I'll, I'll show briefly how I've reworked that. Uh, this is the information processing template. Uh, it looks very much like a standard network template now. What's interesting is he came up with this in 1972, before there, were, there was network-based um, information processing. So I mean, really, just by looking at how living systems process information, he is able to uh, predict what's now a very modern network architecture. This is an example of what the network architecture might look like for a trans-hab. 
uh, context. So we have receive antennas that are, that are uh, inputting data into the network. Uh, we have also nav sensors potentially inputting data. Some of that will go to the nav solution associator. Uh, you also have internal monitoring, like for the life support systems, uh, a timer, some memory, and then COM output. So it fits very well into the context of living systems theory. Another way to view these missions is with mission-directed personnel flow. Obviously, in this case, it's very simple. Uh, you go to low Earth orbit, you have trans-Mars injection burn, you hit Mars, stay on the surface for a while, and come back. So the point of this diagram is really when you start applying it to other categories like information flows, then it helps you define for each uh, mission scenario, for each mission segment, what kind of information flows going back and forth. Presumably, before the mission ever begins, there will be surface, um, surface assets that will support life. So you want to maintain communication with those surface assets. And then the transhab, you'll want to maintain communications with the transhab <coughs> and have, get status back from the transhab. And the transhab will want to communicate with the surface systems that are there to make sure they're still ready or do they need to go into some kind of an abort mode uh, or some kind of mission safe mode? Uh, once on the surface, then you would maintain presumably some contact with Earth. Uh, and so this helps you define your requirements. And so the, the other point uh, that's, that I wanted to bring out that's uh, more important in terms of mission development than, than even the open system architecture is your critical mission threads. And this is used a lot in military planning but I think in this case, it's, it's one of these cases where we can uh, bend swords into plowshares. Uh, and it's very applicable uh, to um, the enterprise architecture modeling of these systems for Mars missions. And so um, one of the things we're doing with uh, Mars Initiative is gathering volunteers to look at what are the critical mission threads and how can we define these open system architectures to help uh, to help model uh, the needs of the systems. What do the systems have to do to support critical mission threads such as exploration uh, uh, and so on. This is now a mass energy flow. So, so ingest, ingesting uh, energy uh, and uh, bringing it into the context of the crew's use, uh, radiating it, uh, injecting. Uh, there's, a, there's two important loops here. There's the wastewater loop and there's the oxygen uh, carbon dioxide loop. Uh, typical resource flow values, and these are typical values. You can see there are big ranges on these values for how much pot pot potable water do you need, how much hygiene water do you need, oxygen, and CO2 is not really a resource, it's more something you have to remove. And, and some of these are somewhat dependent upon the context of technology. You may not get this much gas leakage. Uh, you may not really need that much wash water. It'll depend upon your technology. So I would take this with a grain of salt, but it's a starting point. And it gets back to the critical mission threads that you have to define, what, depending upon what you're expecting the crew to do. How often do they have to go out so outside and uh, do an EVA? How often, um, how busy are they? Or how active are they within the confines of the transhab? Maybe, maybe you don't want them to get any more exercise than they possibly need because they're using more resources. So uh, it's important to define those critical mission threads to know how many resources, where in these ranges of resources are you going to plan. Uh, here, here is the, the same uh, mass energy flow in the, in the context of the surface. Not a lot of difference other than you can now ingest processed uh, uh, produce potentially growing locally and you may be able to ingest uh, water from mined regolith. Uh, and of course, I already discussed, you can, you can uh, get rid of heat uh, through conductive or, or convective means. And uh, so this, this is an example of how you can detail uh, these mass flows. Uh, this is for waste processing. And this particular flow is from the Brightwater uh, Waste Treatment Plant. Uh, so it's just a miniaturized version of a regular waste treatment plant flow. Uh, and you'll notice there's some distribution life support, distribution things happening and some conversion things happening. And then if we go to the drinking water production and we want it drinkable, there's some additional conversion functions happening. I think the, the, my message here is just that when, when you're defining them in terms, when you're categorizing them or stereotyping is, 
is the UML way to put it. When you're stereotyping these activities in terms of living system functions, if you see a lot of the same function over and over like conversion, you know there's probably a simpler way to do it. And so that's a sign that we're, we're just using technology in a way that we've always done it before, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the best way to do it. And so if you look at the living systems theory categories, can we use the bioreactor to do all of this job or half of this job? Are there other uh, biological ways to do this? When you divide any problem by a billion, you have a billion microbes, it makes the problem a lot, a lot easier. Okay, so uh, conclusions on this. Um, I, it's, it's my opinion, and I hope I made a good case, that living systems theory categories are a useful way to help model, and they're also an th orthogonal way uh, to model um, life support systems and crew functions uh, so that you can check to make sure you've got everything. Uh, and then uh, these um, Hatley Purvi, I just call them HP diagrams because it's just easier to pronounce. Uh, these, these are a way to categorize your living systems theory categories because otherwise it, it gets to be too much of a tangle when you're looking at those categories. It helps organize the categories. For follow-on, I really think uh, we need to define, and it, and it really has to come from, from NASA, whoever is providing the requirements for the mission, uh, some critical mission threads that will help us derive what are the real mass, energy, and information budgets that we need to support the crew, uh, how big does the crew have to be for, for a given mission, and then begin partitioning those context diagrams like I've drawn on the board where we start splitting them apart and, and looking at what functions do you want to have close to the crew and support them in their living quarters versus what, are, what, are, what functions are so hazardous that we may want to put them in a service module maybe even as a separate physical entity uh, on the surface for Mars, for instance. Uh, and then you want to develop dynamic models uh, that model this because sometimes we're sleeping, sometimes we're awake, sometimes we're exercising, sometimes we're not. And so it's, it's, it's not a static thing, it's a dynamic uh, thing. And so simulations would, would help inform uh, these models. And then uh, recommend these categories, I don't know, how many people are, are into, uh, into modeling, but uniform modeling language is the archetype for all software modeling. Uh, and so it, system, system modeling has extended it using SysML. I would recommend this as an additional extension uh, for the object modeling group to consider. And, and so that's, that's something that uh, I'm gonna try to take on myself, but obviously there's a lot of work, volunteer work here that the Mars Society might be interested in or our members might be interested in. So that concludes my talk. Thank you for your time and attention. We've got 12 minutes for questions. Great, okay. Uh, you mentioned use of uh, like bacterial life to assist. Um, I've, I agree that it would be useful and helpful, but I'm very nervous about using that uh, because not able to control what nature does. There, yeah. there, there might be unintended consequences. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it was something that we would really want to do in a, in a biosphere type test environment on Earth Those first. Systems. But you could also like contaminate Mars or any other celestial body that you're trying to use it in. It's possible that there could be a way for life to make its way. Yeah, it. and con contamination is going to be an issue no matter what, because for one thing, waste processing will have to be sterilized, so we'll have to be worried about contamination from that point of view. And, and there are agreements, right, about, about what contamination we're allowed to do on a, on a planet. I mean, we're not supposed, you know, we have to take all due precautions to avoid unintentional contamination. That's a, that's a hidden requirement I didn't really touch on, but, but it's a valid requirement. ECLSS. Oh, environmental control in life support systems. Oh. ECLIS, sometimes you hear people say ECLIS too. Uh -huh. And so that's, that's sort of the standard, um, and, I, and I should have defined the EC part. Uh, environmental control is, is uh, the EC part. Um, I saw your, you your phone number at the top. Uh, was it, and your, do you have an email address? Yeah. And at gary.stevenson at linkwist.com is my work, or at gmail.com is my personal, so gary.stevenson. So are you a systems engineer? I am a systems engineer. My day job is uh, enterprise architect for Linkwist, 
And so most of my work is, when you saw the pie chart, is that 60% or 20%, depending on how you define it, for defense. And so I thought, is there a way to leverage uh, this work that has been extremely well developed for defining uh, defense missions? And is, it, is there a way to leverage that same methodology for, for peaceful missions, for missions like NASA missions? So that's one of the things that motivated my talk. Um, I, sorry, I came in a little late. The timing calls for that. But um, yeah. did you touch on anything like um, using like other animals at some point? Like, uh, uh, no, but these these categories. If you read James Miller uh, Miller's book uh, Living Systems, uh, in his book he he does a lot of examples that talk about okay for a given animal. Uh, how, how, where are these categories represented? Some of them are very small life forms down to the bacterial level. And so in a sense you can do requirements flow down almost all, all on the biological side. And, and so if you have, for instance, a conversion of CO2 to oxygen that you want to do, you, you need a, um, you know, an algae bag or something that converts, the algae would have to ingest CO2 and ex extrude or excrete oxygen. Uh, and you know, if you have a billion microbes, then you can divide the amount you need by a billion. Uh, and so you can really do requirements flow down biologically using these categories. In the back. Um, I might have been the one doing the spacesuit paper you were talking about. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that paper. And I thought the follow-on robot was a great idea. Okay. That was actually an ass idea from 2005. But okay. I do much cheaper yeah, I liked your update better. Yeah, anyway, hotspot. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> issue with, I see with this, I, I really like which, where you're going with this. Some of this NASA's already doing. Um, I've seen some similar papers. Yeah, it's that. just not in a methodical, not as, as a methodical way as I have imagined it. But I, that you're right. NASA is doing some of this, and they are um, trying. I think they're, they're edging towards defining mission threads. It's just that it would be far, so much far more helpful if they, if they picked a, a small specific set of like three really critical mission scenarios. You can call them scenarios too. And it's like, we want to do exploration. We, we want to do uh, sampling. Uh, and this is exactly how far we're expecting the astronauts to go, just as a reference mission. Because right now, uh, Design Reference Mission Architecture 5 didn't really ever go to that level of detail. Uh, that would be beneficial for determining, you know, how much of each of these uh, resources, if you go to the resource thing, you know, how much, how, mu how much, what, a, what is the real resource requirements? These, these need to be, in a sense, derived from, from uh, human metabolism requirements, but also from what, what is the human doing you know, and why is their metabolism running at that rate? There is going to be an inherent range no matter what based on the variability of people. People are just different. Yeah, but. So, yeah, the point I was actually trying to make, I wasn't trying to just to my own horn about the other. Um, I'm a business information now analyst. Oh, okay. So I'm kind of in a similar IT. Yeah, you, you, right. So what I find is that, and this is why I think I'm, I'm reasonably good at this sort of thing, uh, for somebody who's not in the aerospace field, is that aerospace focus on, focuses on systems engineering. And they do it really well. But in the IT side, where we're doing systems analysis and, and so forth, we have to deal with the fact that we're, they, they were dealing with Moore's Law in aerospace until about 1970. We're still dealing with it. Mm -hmm. So our methodologies are constantly evolving mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to deal with the fact that we have to compete with other companies that are moving at a higher speed. So the methods I apply, and I, I noticed you had UML toward the end of it. Yeah. Um, I, I think that this is a brilliant merger of the two, the two elements. It's incomplete, unfortunately. Thank you for the compliment. But it's, it, it is incomplete because the, the thing, I'm, I just barely scratched the surface with the context diagrams. The thing that's missing here is, is your use case analysis. You talked about, you brought up use case analysis yesterday in your paper. And five more minutes, okay. And just in a nutshell, that is absolutely the way, once you've defined your critical mission threads at, the very, at a very high level, that is the way to decompose them. 
uh, and is using that use case analysis. And once you've got those use cases, we have to do A, B, and C, then we'll, well, what, where in our subsystem does that, does that touch? Uh, and so defining those use cases will help define the activities diagrams that you need to, to define a sequence of, of things that have to happen in your activity flow. And, and pretty soon you have all of your requirements developed. What's that UML? Uniform modeling language. Uh, and system modeling language was an extension of it. And what I'm proposing is that uh, from, a, from a functional stereotype point of view, you, you can extend it further with living systems theory, at least adding that additional uh, functional stereotype. Now, right now, you can, you can kind of fake that in. You can define those yourselves. But my concern is if you allow the users to define those themselves, there won't be uniformity. It would be better if OMG did it, if they defined it as object management group, uh, as, a, as a committee. And that is also why I, I wanted to stress uh, the, the open systems architecture point of view too, that when we start decomposing these systems, each interface, we should, we should pick the, the uh, best of breed, I guess you, you would call it, the, the best commercial or, or NASA or military interface standard available for each of those and make that um, a standard across uh, commercial industry, just, just as IEEE 802.11b. How many people have read that? You know, but, but everybody uses Wi-Fi. Well, the reason Wi-Fi took off is, number one, it was a public band. It was a junk band that microwave ovens were using. And so nobody wanted to use it, so it was available for public use. And number two, IEEE committee went through the difficult work of defining that as a commercial standard. So. That, that is one of the reasons I think that commercial space keeps stalling out is we haven't gone through the work of defining those commercial space standards to create an open system architecture for, for space hardware. And uh, as, as evidence for that, I'll point out the CubeSat story because CubeSats weren't invented until 99, but already it's an amazing success story uh, and they're very, very inexpensive. Why? Because they have a defined set of standards. Uh, and so really, we, we need to do something similar, what, what's been done with CubeSats, only on a, on a much larger scale for these, for these human um, uh, living support systems and, and propulsion systems and um, for the deep space interplanetary missions. If you would have loved my paper last year, I can show you one of my other I, I would love to. <laughs> you've got my email, I hope. I, I, I'll give you my card, too. I would love to get a copy. Other questions? All right, thank you very much. Very good.